It's Wednesday, April 24th, 2013, and this is the Energy Education Podcast. I'm Kevin Hurley. Today on the show, we're joined by special guest and Nobel Prize nominee Dr. Helen Caldicott and Arnie Gunderson to discuss a multitude of issues, including various types of radioactive releases, their associated health risks, and how regulators and the nuclear industry are downplaying those releases. Radiation contamination is very difficult to clean up, and rather than working to lower radiation exposure to the public, government officials and industry promoters around the world are pushing to raise the standard of maximum allowable radiation concentration levels to the public. Finally, we'll share some details about the Fukushima cleanup and how the people of Japan will be best served if the Tokyo Electric Power Company is removed from oversight of the Fukushima cleanup and an independent company replaces them to deal with the problem head-on. Today I'd like to welcome Dr. Helen Caldicott to the show. Dr. Caldicott, thanks for coming on. Pleasure. And of course, Arnie Gunderson, thanks for joining us. Hey, Kevin. Thanks again for having me. Well, Helen, the last time we spoke was before the New York City Symposium. How did that go? Yes, I was particularly pleased with how it went. It was really flawless. Everyone turned up. The the papers were absolutely excellent, and it wasn't boring at all. Each paper had a different aspect about nuclear power radiation and the damages to the environment and the health. And people were absolutely thrilled. We had about 300 people there. Not as much media as I wanted to because I put it on to educate the media. However, it's available online at the Helen Caldicott Foundation.org. It is now being translated into Japanese because the Japanese really want to be able to access it. And also it's presently being transcribed to be published in a book by the New Press. I hope fairly shortly. In addition, there were 4,000 people connected on Ustream. That's right, and I I think about 360 cities logged in to watch it, so it did get a fairly wide exposure, and, you know, it was the latest in the science related to radiation, nuclear accidents, and the like, and so it gives people ammunition who are fighting local reactors to take on bodies like the NRC, etc., because then they'll know what they're talking about and have lots of facts at their fingertips. Well, speaking about ammunition and fighting the government, the Environmental Protection Agency is now talking about raising the radiation limits, the maximum allowable radiation limits after a nuclear accident. To me, and probably many others, this really seems like just one more way of making the Fukushima Daiichi problem go away. That's right. If you can't decrease the water level, you elevate the bridge. (laughs) So um, the truth is that if there is a nuclear accident, it doesn't matter what your standard to exposure to radiation for human beings, after a nuclear accident like Fukushima, the large contiguous areas become extremely radioactive and will be so for hundreds of years. So it's really just putting the icing on the cake, so to speak. The cake's already there and they're admitting that they can do nothing about it. It gave everyone a shock, but the truth is that once an area's been contaminated, that's it. And I suppose they're just coming to terms with reality. But it's very, very scary and it makes people understand what a nuclear accident would really mean. Now, a nuclear plant releases a bunch of different types of radiation. In my report, I I spent a lot of time talking about the noble gases that were released. Enormous concentrations for five or six days of noble gases came out of Fukushima Daiichi. Now, they are inside the fuel, and as soon as the fuel cracks, we don't need a meltdown, as soon as the fuel cracks, the gases escape into the containment. But I think what Daiichi showed us is that uh, the containments failed as well. So the last barrier of defense failed, releasing huge amounts of noble gases. Can you talk a little bit about some of the medical consequences? Well, now, I think you said only three times more noble gases were released at Fukushima than at Chernobyl. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Noble gases or noble elements are those that do not combine chemically with anything in the body. They're sort of kind of neutral. 
because, you know, carbon-14 actually combines in the DNA molecule, so does tritium, and strontium as a calcium analog gets into bone, etc. But noble gases don't go specifically to anywhere in the body because of their chemical uh, makeup. However, noble gases are very high-energy gamma emitters, like X-rays. And so if you're immersed in a cloud of noble gases, you're going to get a big dose of radiation, external radiation, like an X-ray. However, if you inhale the noble gases, and they are xenon, krypton, and argon, xenon being the worst, you inhale the gases, and in fact... They readily pass through the alveoli, um, the little air sacs in the lung, into the blood where they circulate and they are fat soluble. So they, they deposit in the fatty tissues of the body, which are the abdominal fat pad and the upper thighs where there's a lot of fat. And they there irradiate very important cells with gamma radiation, the ovaries and testicles. And so people who who are immersed in a cloud of radioactive gases like at Fukushima and Three Mile Island and Chernobyl get a hell of a dose of radiation, not just to the ovaries and testicles, which are very important, but to other organs of the body. I used to use xenon-133 in my patients to estimate their lung function. Patients with cystic fibrosis have their lungs clogged up with pus and mucus, very thick mucus. And so areas of the lung become totally non-functional. So we would do ventilation fusion scans to see what areas of the lung are in, are in truth being ventilated and what areas are being perfused by the blood. And we are now using um, xenon-133 to uh, look at fatty tumours in the body to isolate them because, as I said, it. Uh, they're very fat-soluble, these noble gases. Well, let me refer our listeners to the, the presentation I gave at the conference where I spent a large amount of time talking about the, the noble gas releases. So if you want to learn more about the quantities that were released, and like I said, there are three times what was released after Chernobyl, go over to uh, the Fairwinds website, and there's a separate uh, video on the presentation that, that I made through the Caldecott Foundation in uh, New York City back in March. Ani, I've got a question. Can you extrapolate from the fact that there are three times more noble gases released at Fukushima than Chernobyl to other isotopes too? Could you therefore say that most of the other isotopes would be three times that released at Chernobyl or not? Yeah, I talk about that in the presentation. Some of the isotopes do plate out. I think the cesium concentration is going to be comparable to what was released at Chernobyl. Uh, there was some played out in chemical reactions, but I think the IAEA and the Japanese are grossly downplaying the cesium releases. You know, if you go back to what Steve Wing said in Harrisburg four years ago, you know, there were noticeable increases in lung cancer for the people that lived within 30 miles of Three Mile Island in the first 10 days of the accident. So five years after the accident, people began to get lung cancer. And that's the only thing Steve could measure, but I attribute that to uh, to breathing uh, enormous amounts of noble I think, yes, I think you might be right about that. In fact, I think that lung cancer started to appear two years after the Three Mile Island accident, which is extremely early. You would not expect lung cancers to arise for probably 15 years, but they they appeared very early, which would indicate, therefore, that the people at Three Mile Island got a hell of a dose of gamma radiation to their lungs from the noble gases as they inhaled them. And so we would expect to see that around Fukushima now. We're just sitting on a powder keg of, of cancers. And where it goes in your body and what it does to your body? Cesium... There are three isotopes, 137, 134, and one, I can't remember the other one, Arnie. But cesium-137 has a half-life of 30 years, which you multiply by 10 to get its total radiological life, its total radioactive life, and so that's 300 years. Some multiply it by 20 to say 600 years. It's a very high-energy gamma emitter, but it also emits beta radiation, which is just an electron emitted from the unstable nucleus. And it doesn't do any damage to you unless you get cesium inside your body. 
Now, cesium lands on the soil and it's a potassium analogue. It's very much like the element potassium and our bodies are very rich with potassium. All cells contain potassium. And therefore, the cesium lands on the soil and concentrates by orders of magnitude, 10 to 100 to thousands of times at each step of the food chain, the grass, the meat, the milk, and then into our bodies or into wheat or into rice or into vegetables or into green tea or into fish. And it really concentrates in fish because there are various levels. There are algae, then crustaceans, then little fish, then big fish. So the bioconcentration is in the food chain and the seeds, pretty uh, high. Now, when you eat food with cesium in it, you can't taste it. You can't smell it and you can't see it. It's invisible to our senses. And it's absorbed from the bowel because the body thinks it's potassium. And it goes to many organs in the body, like the brain, where it can cause brain cancer. It is concentrated in muscles because they're rich in potassium, where it can form very well, rare form of cancer, rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, and that's a very nasty cancer that spreads incredibly fast. And in fact, I lived on Long Island near the Brookhaven National Labs where there had been a meltdown some years before. And there were 19 children at the time who developed rhabdomyosarcoma. And over time, that's just extremely rare and would indicate that the area was contaminated with cesium 137. It also can concentrate in the ovaries and the testicles where it can damage the eggs and the sperm, uh, causing genetic disease for future generations. And it concentrates in heart muscle and it can cause gross abnormalities in the conduction system of the heart, um, causing sudden death or cardiac irregularities. And it also concentrates in the endocrine systems in the thyroid and in the pancreas where insulin is produced. So it's a very nasty poison and will remain active in the food around Fukushima for hundreds of years. You know, I think you said something really important there in that, you know, we, we worry about um, radiation and cancer, but in fact, there are non-cancer problems associated with cesium as well. Well, yes. If you read the report from Chernobyl published by the New York Academy of Sciences, which was put together by Alexei Yablokov from Russia, there are many diseases caused by radio exposure to radiation. One is cataracts of the lenses, so people can go relatively blind. One is premature aging of children. That's called progeria, they, they age very fast. Diabetes is virtually an epidemic around Chernobyl now. Thyroid abnormalities, hypothyroidism, where the thyroid doesn't pump enough, enough hormones, so you get what's called myxedema, very slow, you put on weight, your hair falls out, your mental capacities decline, and your appetite goes away, and your periods stop. And that, that's a nasty disease. Also, of course, it causes thyroid cancer. And lots of other abnormalities. Uh, babies who were in utero at the time of the accident were exposed to radiation, which damages the developing nervous system. So in Sweden, they've done a survey of babies who were in utero at the time of Chernobyl, and they have lower than normal IQs. There are homes around Chernobyl full of the most grossly deformed children because they were damaged in the first three months of intrauterine life where limbs grow and brain grows and heart grows and so radiation can damage a cell that's going to form the left half of the brain, for instance, or the right arm, like Slytherite did. And we've never seen so many grossly deformed children as you see in those homes in Chernobyl. There's a film made about it called Chernobyl Heart. If you read that book from the New York Academy of Sciences called Chernobyl, it is, I think, the most alarming medical survey that I have ever read in my uh, medical uh, existence. Radiation can just do a whole lot of just dreadful things. You know, we seem to focus on the, the, the cesium concentrations, but, but scientifically, the, the cesium is easy to detect. 
So everyone is saying, well, the cesium concentration is, but it doesn't mean that cesium is the only isotope out there. It's just the sort of the canary in the mine shaft, if you will. I'm sure that there's strontium, which is very difficult to detect, and that is a, is a problem because that goes to the bone. Yeah, strontium-90, it has a half-life of 28 years, so it's around for 300 years as well in the food. And it's a calcium analogue. It's a beta emitter, so it's very hard to... You can't detect it, really, with the Geiger counter. And it gets into the food, concentrates, as I said, especially in milk and cheese and yogurt and the like. And when it gets into the gut, the body says, oh, calcium. And so it's transported through the blood to the bone and the teeth where it's laid down. And the beta particle can damage a regulatory gene in a bone cell and the bone sits quietly for the incubation time for cancers any time from 5 to 80 years. And one day that cell divides in an unregulated way and that's a bone cancer, osteogenic sarcoma. Kenny Kennedy's son had that and had his leg amputated. Little Edward... It also causes leukemia because the white blood cells are made in the bone marrow. So if you radiate a white blood cell and the regulatory gene is damaged, the white blood cell begins to proliferate in its trillions. Leukemia means white blood and the blood fills up with immature white blood cells which can't fight infection and the bone marrow gets packed with white blood cells so there's no room for platelets to grow which cause clotting. So patients with leukemia die either of massive hemorrhage and or massive infection, a bit like the way AIDS patients die. You know, here in the United States, when we detect strontium in fish, the nuclear industry's position, well, it's in the bone and nobody eats the bone. We always eat the meat. But the the problem in Japan is that frequently there's a lot of fish stews created. And when you boil the, the fish bone, the strontium doesn't stay in the bone again. It goes into the stew and can be re-ingested by the people that eat the fish stew. That's right. And also a lot of Japanese eat the bones of the fish if the fish are small and the bones are small. So moving along now, let's talk a little bit about iodine. Okay. There are two iodine isotopes. One is iodine-131, which has a half-life of eight days, meaning it lasts only for about 10 weeks before it decays away to nothing. It's a very high-energy gamma emitter, like that X-ray I talked about, and also a beta emitter, the electrons. And iodine only goes to one gland in the body, which is the thyroid gland, which sucks it up. But particularly in children, their thyroids are like a little sponge, and they suck up iodine, particularly in areas where iodine is sparse in the environment, like around Chernobyl. So they have low iodine levels, and so the thyroid particularly concentrates it Um, and so the iodine can change a regulatory gene in the thyroid gland in a cell and cause cancer. Now already in Fukushima we've we've seen I think about 10 thyroid cancers developing in children. That's extremely rare because it took five years for thyroid cancers to start manifesting after Chernobyl. So this is very early, it's only two years, indicating to me as a paediatrician that these children got a hell of a dose of radioactive iodine, um, but also they got a big dose of everything else. And, and, you know, as Arnie knows, nuclear reactors contain several hundred of these poisons. Some only last seconds, but some last millions of years. So there's a whole cocktail of radioactive elements that people will have inhaled and eaten. The other iodine is iodine-129, which has a half-life of 17 million years. So it's around forever. It's not as potently radioactive as I-131, but it's still carcinogenic, and that's around forever. Well, we've talked a little bit about potassium iodine pills in the past and how they might be helpful to people in a nuclear accident. But how exactly do they work? My understanding is that they go to the thyroid and somehow protect the thyroid from radiation exposure? Well, potassium iodine is just an inert substance. It's not radioactive, but there's a a catch. You have to take your potassium iodine tablet before the radioactive cloud reaches you, before you inhale the iodine, which, which is absorbed from the lung. And mostly, well, in the major accidents, 
Fukushima, Chernobyl and Simile Island, people didn't know about it till days after the accidents occur because the authorities don't let them know whereby and by which time they've already inhaled radioactive iodine that's too late. You have to take it before the cloud of radioactive iodine reaches you and what it does is saturate the thyroid with normal iodine so the thyroid will reject I think 70% of the radioactive iodine but I think 30% still gets incorporated into the uh, our thyroid. The other thing is of course radioactive iodine is concentrated readily in food and particularly in milk so children drinking milk that comes from cows or goats or sheep that have been contaminated from a reactor accident are drinking radioactive iodine so you know you might have you know potassium iodide tablets in your medicine cupboard if you live near a reactor or far from a reactor in fact but you probably won't know in time to take the, the iodine anywhere and it only protects the thyroid, not totally, as I said, 70%, not 100%, and it doesn't protect any other organs. So clearly potassium iodine pills or tablets can help people in the event of a nuclear accident if they're dispensed quickly. However, we see during the Three Mile Island accident and now the Fukushima accident that they were withheld. They were not dispensed quickly. Why is that? Yes, that's right. They don't want to give it a bad name. So if, you, if, they, if the health authorities say, look, you've got to have these tablets in cases of meltdown, everyone gets very panicked, and so you don't want to create panic. And that was the, the Japanese government, in fact, stated that. They didn't tell the people where the very highly radioactive cloud was moving across the country, northwest, because they didn't want to create panic. And the people evacuated right into that, the path of that radioactive plume, that is obscene. So the government officials, in fact, protecting and and a part of the nuclear industry, they're not there to protect the people, although we elect them and we pay for them. You know, all these isotopes indicate a couple of things to me. They indicate that nuclear fuel failed, and we know that. I mean, there was a, a meltdown and a melt through of the nuclear reactor vessels. But that wouldn't be enough unless the containment failed too. The containment is that last line of defense. And, you know, that we're seeing cesium in the environment. And now we're seeing heavy isotopes like plutonium out at 20 and 30 kilometers. So when you see these, um, these transuranics, the things that are heavier than uranium out there, all these are signs of gross containment failure. Well, let's shift gears now and talk about the one isotope that's probably been ignored more than any other by the nuclear industry, and that's tritium. Helen, can you tell us a bit about tritium? Tritium is radioactive hydrogen. Instead of being H2, it's H3. And tritium cannot be contained in anything except gold. (laughs) So you can't operate a nuclear reactor without it continuously releasing into the air and the water that's used to cool it, tritium. Tritium, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny particle. And if you're enveloped, and and it combines with oxygen to form tritiated water, H3O. So if you're near a reactor and there's an inversion system and there's fog and you go outside, the fog lands on your skin and the tritium can get right through the skin. Now, the skin lets nothing through. It's the most important organ in the body, which is why it's so serious if you get bad bad third degree burns over your body. You lose your integument. Tritium gets through. Tritium also concentrates in food and it's in the water and it it combines in the DNA molecule, which is the gene. It's incredibly carcinogenic. And although the nuclear industry poo-poos anyone who, who worries about it, if you look at the Journal of Health Physics, there are huge there's a huge number of articles about the toxicity of tritium and they've been testing it on mice and rats for years and years and years and so it induces brain tumors muscle tumors all sorts of cancers all over the body and mind you every cancer can be caused by radiation every cancer we described in medicine can be induced by radiation it also causes very gross fetal abnormalities and birth deformities So tritium is a very, very scary element. It's used in exit signs and, of course, it's leaking out of them. 
It's used on watch dials and it leaks out of the watches. It leaks out of everything you put it into. So, um, and I think the Germans did a study to look at children under the age of five years living within two miles of 16 reactors and found that those children have, had a double the incidence of leukemia and a high incidence of solid cancers. And the French verified that study by doing a study of their own around their reactors. So it's very dangerous to live near a reactor and children are 10 to 20 times more sensitive to radiation than adults. They get cancer much more readily and fetuses are thousands of times more so. So no women of childbearing age or children should live near a reactor. That's never talked about and it's partly because of the tritium that gets in. It also gets into the leaves and transpires through the leaves with water that comes down at night and lands on the ground, etc. The one thing that we haven't talked about, Arnie, is the toxicity of plutonium, and I'd like to talk about that. Plutonium is an alpha emitter, so it's like an electron emitted from a nucleus, only it's bigger, much bigger. And if it hits a gene, bang, it usually dis destroys the cell, but if it doesn't, the cell is damaged, and almost certainly later you'll get cancer. So... Plutonium, named after Pluto, is so toxic that a millionth of a gram, if inhaled into the lung, will give you lung cancer. Each reactor makes 250 kilograms of plutonium a year, kilograms. You need only five kilograms to make yourself an atomic bomb. Um, plutonium has a half-life of 24,400 years, so it's around and toxic for a quarter of a million years. The body thinks that plutonium is iron, so it can cause lung cancer. It goes to the bone where the hemoglobin is made, where it can cause bone cancer or leukemia or multiple myeloma or other such cancers. It's stored in the liver where it can cause liver cancer. It crosses the placenta. The placenta lets nothing through to protect the fetus, but plutonium gets through because it is an iron analogue where, like thalidomide, it can kill a cell that's going to form the left half of the brain or the right arm. That's called teratogenesis, damage of a genetically, chromosomally normal fetus. It also has a predilection for testicles and tends to concentrate in the testicles next to the cells that are forming the sperm, so it can produce genetic mutations in the sperm to induce genetic diseases passed on generation to generation. For the rest of time, and there are 2,600 genetic diseases now described like diabetes and cystic fibrosis and haemophilia and many, many others. So plutonium's nasty, but there's something nastier, and that's americium-241, which is a decay product, I think, of plutonium-241, which has a fairly short half-life. So americium-241 is a potent gamma emitter as well as a, an alpha emitter, and they're extremely worried in, in, in Europe because 40% of Europe is contaminated with fallout from Chernobyl and will remain so for hundreds of years. But the americium is now starting to build up as the plutonium two-for-one decays and it's very, very toxic and radioactive. So things are going to get worse in Europe over time, not better. And that's described vividly in the book on Chernobyl by the New York Academy of Sciences. Wow, Helen. I don't, uh, I don't know how you, um, you go to sleep at night. Well, I go to sleep by doing this work, which makes me feel more comfortable and that I might make a difference. But in truth, Arnie, we're not making a lot of difference, are we? I think we are in Japan. I think uh, the Japanese are listening to people like you and the people that went to the symposium more and more and listening to their own government and Tokyo Electric less and less. Yeah, but you know that I just woke up this morning reading more about Fukushima. It's an absolute mess, a total disaster mess. And they'll never clean it up, never. I mean, the IAEA says it will take 50 years, 40 or 50 years, but they'll never clean it up. Let's be frank, they won't. It's an unmitigated disaster which will remain in perpetuity for the rest of time and although the Japanese may become more and more aware of their situation there's nothing anyone can do about it you know human beings can't cope with with such an atomic nuclear accident you know I talked about the recovery of Fukushima Daiichi 
when I was over in Japan at the end of August, and I was at the Independent Press Association, and the, the video's up on the site, but the recovery of the site will go nowhere as long as Tokyo Electric is in charge. The solution to begin improving the condition of the site is to get Tokyo Electric out of the management of the cleanup and put a competent engineering organization reporting right to Japan, the nation of Japan, being funded by the nation of Japan and being overseen by independent experts as opposed to the, the closed little club that Tokyo Electric likes to keep the site. Until we do that, that site is going to continue to have leaks and you know, rats eating wires and on and on and on. We've got to get TEPCO out of the picture if we ever expect to make improvements. Mm, and think of the number of people. There are 3,000 men there all the time, I think. And they bring homeless men in from Tokyo. Yakuza, who was a Japanese mafia, subcontracted to provide a lot of the workers. How many people are going to die, you know, being exposed to very high levels of radiation externally, but also inhaling and, and ingesting radioactive materials? I mean, the thing is, it's just a medical disaster beyond compare. Dr. Caldicott, thanks for coming on the show. That's a pleasure. And Arnie, as always. Thanks again, Kevin. Well, that about does it for this week's edition of the Energy Education Podcast. You can catch us back here next Wednesday and every Wednesday for more on what's happening in the world of nuclear news and more technical nuclear discussion. Also, don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. For Fairwinds Energy Education, I'm Kevin Hurley. Thanks for listening.